Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. So, um, I imagine that throughout the course of the night, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be looking basically at the same question. Um, is euthanasia morally justifiable? Um, and there are a few different ways that we can define morality here, a few different ways that we can understand it. Um, but all of the information that's given is just to kind of get down to the same question. So we have our ideas kind of going in our mind right now, which is good. Hopefully some of the information that's going to be given it's going to help us uh, parse through, break down our ideas a little bit better. Um, were there any big ideas that came out for anybody that you'd like to share during this first, during this first small group discussion? I see a finger pointed. Um, just for like the definitions that were shared earlier, where it was like euthanasia was um, like a painless death to end pain and suffering, um, and so euthanasia versus like assisted suicide or suicide um, a lot of like suicides are different kind of pain and suffering so I was just wondering if um, like the definitions that were provided if it was just exclusive to physical pain and suffering if there was any distinction with that with like law and morality and stuff like that yeah, excellent. Yeah, so right now, most countries around the world, they do draw a line where if someone is not mentally sound to make a decision to uh, um, to undergo euthanasia, then generally the courts don't allow them to undergo euthanasia. It's actually illegal. Um, and what this means is that people who are even experiencing extreme physical pain because of some kind of mental disability, um, that they're not able to... Um, undergo euthanasia, which is a big problem. You know, there are some people who experience intense, fiery, acidy, horrible physical pain every day of their life because of a mental issue. But if it's a mental issue in most countries around the world, they say this does not uh, justify euthanasia. Um, some doctors certainly will, and there's a big fight for this right now. Um, in Switzerland, which is kind of, kind of, one of the more liberal places for this, uh, in Switzerland, suicide, period, is legal. Um, so there are many people who go to Switzerland uh, to commit suicide. Physician-assisted suicide, which means getting some kind of pill, um, is uh, also a common practice over there. So you don't need to prove uh, that you have uh, a physical disorder. You can just get the pills from a doctor. Um, I'm sure that there's s more to it than just that. I don't think it's over the counter or something. I'm sure that there is a process. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Switzerland moving forward. Um, so even if it's not exactly related to this topic, was there anything else that, that came up for anybody we can, we can share and then we'll, we'll move on to some of, the, some of the other arguments that are made? Well, uh, I know that in Vietnam, you know, if a patient is like in pain and but he is still like he's still sad, he's still conscious, and he 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 doesn't want to die. But his like um, his family think that is incurable, and wants him to stop the stop receiving the treatment in the hospital. So in this case, um, the it's, it it seems that the hospital has the tendency to um, act as act according to the will of the family. Because if in in case the patient does do not have the capability to pay the bill, so so he will be dismissed out of the capital and die. But do you think that it is like morally morally wrong, kind of? Well, I definitely don't think it's my job to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm really glad that you bring it up. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a really 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 interesting point. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna see more examples of this. Uh, the the kind of um, the two fists that are butting heads in a lot of cases um, when dealing legally with euthanasia. Yeah, certainly. Okay, all right. So guys, um, let's take a look at some of the arguments that have been put forward. So we're not really. Uh, yeah, Laura. Yeah, good. Um, that's really interesting about the. Vietnamese with the hospital um, not being able to pay the bills and the family even if he's conscious and sound of mind because I felt like with the discussion it it was more suicide rather than murder but for me uh, intrinsically that kind of feels more like murder <laughs> than, than suicide yeah. but <laughs> that just really goes to my heart and, 
Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to do some more research on what exactly is meant by sound mind in these cases. I can't imagine that your family in Vietnam is just able to dislike you and then decide that they want to put you under. I'm sure that that's not the case. <laughs> you know, maybe. Who knows in good old Vietnam. Um, okay, so uh, we can start with a couple of the arguments. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail in some of these, but I'll show you just what we're going to cover. So first of all, we're going to look at the arguments that are made between the sanctity of life versus our personal autonomy. It seems like the government really values uh, sanctity of life, and many people do, uh, but a lot of people say, no, this is my goddamn body, and I get to do with it whatever I want. You don't get to tell me what to do. Okay, then we're going to be looking at fairness and equal protection. So this is a, um, it's, I don't think it's a very clear term, but these are the terms that tend to be used when we talk about um, the fact that generally we say that it's a right to refuse treatment. Uh, so if you are terminally ill and you want to refuse treatment, that's normally fine. Um, and if a doctor allows that, what exactly is the moral difference between allowing someone to die and actively killing someone? Right. So if we allow the right to refuse treatment, then it seems as though logically it should imply that there's also a right to assisted suicide. Uh, then we're going to be looking at natural... Sorry, guys. Then we're going to be... Uh-oh. Oh, no. Oh, I really lost my place. Uh-oh. That was a big mistake. Hold on. All right. I'm going to get it in five, four, three, two, and one. Okay. Then we're going to be looking at natural versus unnatural death. Um, and then also this uh, this idea of death with dignity. Um, the historical record, actually, we're not going to be getting into tonight, um, but it's it's really fascinating. There's some great books. Um, Neil M. Gorsuch was one of the big inspirations for this whole uh, process. One of the new uh, Supreme Court justices in the United States wrote his doctoral thesis on um, a history of arguments made for and against euthanasia, so I'd really recommend checking that out if you get the chance. Um, and then the role that intent plays in the, the moral landscape that we're painting here, um, and then also utilitarian arguments made. So what are the societal benefits and what are the societal consequences of allowing or not allowing euthanasia? Okay. Um, so if there are any more big arguments that anybody thinks of while we go along, maybe we can add this to our list, which would be pretty cool. Okay, so the first one we have is sanctity of life versus personal autonomy. So once again, we have all these uh, people who believe that human life is just inherently valuable. Um, it doesn't really maybe matter what we do with that life. Human life is the end goal. Uh, Immanuel Kant, you might know, was pretty famous for saying that human life should always be treated as an ends, not as a means. Right? It's not as though human life does something for the world, therefore we should value human life. Instead, it's that everything that we do is just to promote human life. So we shouldn't be looking at human beings uh, as some kind of tool that we're using in the world. We don't look at human beings and say, oh, you don't serve a function anymore, therefore we can get rid of you. Instead, every human life has inherent value, therefore we need to save every single human life. Also, Immanuel Kant was well known for what was called the categorical imperative. Raise your hand if you've heard of the categorical imperative. One, two, three, four people. Excellent. Yeah, cool. So, categorical imperative was an attempt by Immanuel Kant to bridge the divide that had been created since the absence of religion in the world. He said, how are we going to have any kind of moral system if there is no religion? And he said, okay, I have an idea. Maybe we can look at what I'll call the categorical imperative, which says, if the whole world were to adopt this belief, would the world still function? Stealing is wrong because if everyone stole from each other, society would shut down. Murder is wrong because if everybody killed each other, society would shut down, right? There doesn't need to be any God or religious structure. It just has to do with if this were a law for everyone to follow, would society still function? That's Kant's categorical imperative. Extended to assisted suicide, if we were to say that everyone would perform assisted suicide, uh, I think it's safe to say that society would very quickly shut down, therefore not meeting Kant's categorical imperative. 
Now, this goes against the idea of personal autonomy. So we have rights as human beings. I have my body, and I'm allowed to do with my body whatever I want. Who the hell are you to tell me that I can't, government? Now, on the flip side, it seems as though living within a civilized society, there are certain rights that we give up. I'm not allowed to run naked along the street. I'm not allowed to stab and kill and steal anybody that I want to. Um, not that I really do want to, wink, wink. Um, <laughs> so there are certain freedoms that we give up in exchange for living within a civilized society. Right? So those are the two kind of sides of the debate between sanctity of life versus personal autonomy. I'm going to run through these different arguments. Um, and if at any point you have a question or a thought, you can just raise your hand or shout it out or something, and we'll, we'll address that. Yeah, please. Just as you said. Um, well, yeah, I was just thinking about what you're saying about personal freedoms. Is, uh, like we, all, we all know the case of someone that maybe uh, more it's more of an extreme example, I suppose, but maybe they're addicted to something like heroin, and then uh, they, you know, perform uh, criminal acts where they steal off of someone. So coming down to that sort of personal freedom uh, for them, do they have the usual freedom that you'd expect? Uh, a general human being to have when they're faced with uh, this addiction, which is so powerful that it's making them act in a way where maybe they wouldn't act normally in such a way. So I suppose there's a question of freedom in that. So um, this is also something that I'm not going to answer, right? But when we talk about voluntary action versus involuntary action, and free will, I think, is really what you're getting at, we could make an argument that literally every single one of our decisions are made because of some external stimuli, whether that external stimuli is even the cells that we were given, the DNA that we were given, that we were born with, that we didn't choose. I didn't choose this DNA. I didn't choose the desire to steal and to take and to whatever. I didn't choose these things, so I shouldn't be responsible. Um, yeah, I think it's a really great point that you bring up. So if you're under the influence of some kind of drug or under any kind of duress or even stress, changes the decisions that we make quite a lot. Yeah. Um, one thing that's often brought up here is that um, the reason why, say, stealing is bad is because you're hurting someone else. You're, sti you're taking something away from another person. Murder is bad because you're taking away from another person. What are you taking away when you decide to kill yourself um, or engage in euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide? Okay, well, some people answer that you're actually harming your society. You are harming your family because they're really, really, really going to miss you. And then the other side of the debate would say, well, yeah, you're allowed to just abscond. You're allowed to leave your family, move out into the woods. This isn't illegal. You can do this. Um, it's not illegal for you to go off into the woods and to leave your family. They're going to feel sad. We have a right to make people feel sad. This shouldn't be a decision of the government to tell us that we can't leave if we want to. Okay, this debate can keep ping-ponging back and forth, um, which I'm going to leave for the small groups after this little section. Um, for right now, we're going to move on to what's called willpower. Um, so, uh, I had uh, a great aunt, my, my mother's aunt, and my mother's aunt had signed a DNR, a do not resuscitate letter, uh, when she was in her 90s. And... Towards the end of her life, several times, she was in the hospital, um, and, uh, and they were needing to perform, or I think she was in a nursing home, uh, and she was undergoing some kind of uh, attack, and then the doctors came in, and they said, yeah, we can't do anything, you've signed a DNR, a do not resuscitate order, and then she'd say, fuck the DNR, don't listen to that, I'm dying, save my life, you're a doctor, and then the doctors decided to save her life. They listened to her words in the moment, rather than what she actually decided. Many people say, in the case of euthanasia, that if you can't kill yourself on your own, if you don't have the fortitude, the strength, the willpower to jump off a bridge, to shoot yourself in the head, to take these pills on your own, and instead you need someone else to do it, this is a clear indication that you don't really want to kill yourself. And maybe we can use this as a kind of barometer, as a kind of measurement to prove whether or not you actually want to die, if you're able to commit the act on your own. 
The other side of this argument would then say, well, there are lots of things that we genuinely want to do that we just don't have the willpower to do. Lots of cigarette smokers genuinely want to quit, and they just don't have the willpower to do so. It doesn't mean they don't want to. Many alcoholics genuinely want to quit. Many overeaters genuinely want to stop. It doesn't mean they don't want to just because they're unable. The same would go for something like assisted suicide. Again, this can ping pong back and forth which we'll have time to do in our small groups. Okay, so now we get into what's called fairness and equal protection. Again, these are uh, kind of lengthy terms, um, but generally what's being said here is, um, do we all agree that it is a right to refuse medical care in the last hours of our death? Do we all think that that's a right? Okay, good. So, um, many physicians would then say that or sorry, many thinkers on this, many academics would then say that it's logically consistent if we allow a person to deny health care, then, then we should allow them the right to, um, to receive euthanasia. So that's the argument of fairness and equal protection. Okay? Any questions about that one? Okay, and then many people say that euthanasia is not a very natural way to die, that we really value dying naturally. Uh, We don't live very naturally, but we want to die very naturally. And when we perform euthanasia, what we're doing in a way is playing God. We're saying, we're not going to let nature take its course. We're going to take life and death into our own hands. Um, So they say, no, this is unnatural. We want to let you die naturally. On the other side of the spectrum, the other side of the debate, many physicians actually say that it's a more active role for them to just unplug the feeding tubes. Um, Does anybody know how long a human is able to survive without food? Seven to ten days? Yeah, about that. So Terry Schiavo, one of the most famous cases of euthanasia that we had, Terry Schiavo, um, if anybody doesn't know, her husband uh, wanted to, to pull the plug. Her family wanted to continue support, and there was a legal battle that went on a very, very long time. It took Terry Schiavo 12 years, sorry, 12 days to die um, after they eventually pulled the plug. She starved to death. She starved to death. They took out her feeding tubes. Twelve days of this. Doctors say that it was way more active for them to ignore her, um, her visible signs of pain and hunger than it would be an active role for them just to inject this lethal ther- serum. Right? So it's not very clear which is a natural way to die which is a natural response to death. Another argument to this would be that human beings are certainly a part of nature. Is a beaver dam any more natural than uh, a skyscraper? It's hard to say. So is euthanasia not just as natural as any other kind of death? That's right. (laughs) That's right. But then the argument loses all power. Yeah. Okay. So, where most arguments end up tends to be intent. So, um, at the beginning, I had mentioned self-defense, right? That we tend to say that it's justifiable. If you were in the process of defending yourself to kill a person, we tend to consider this to be morally justifiable. But this really comes down to the intention of the act. If you get into a fight, or if you um, if if you egg somebody on to fight you with the intention of them punching you in the face, so that you can then stab them in the stomach, we wouldn't really consider this morally justifiable. It was your intention to kill this person. If instead you got into a fight just happenstancically and you happen to accidentally kill the person while defending yourself, that's when we consider this to be morally justifiable. (coughs) 
Now, if a doctor were to end life support, it's very possible that the doctor was doing this with some kind of malicious means. They might be doing this with the intention of killing the person. So maybe the family, like the Vietnamese family, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Maybe the, <laughs> maybe the family decides to pull the plug because there's a, a great life insurance policy that's going to pay out $500,000 if this person dies. But the policy decreases in value the longer the person lives. So they want to kill the person faster. Well, the intention then is not to put the person out of their suffering. The intention is to kill the person. It's certainly possible to um, not perform euthanasia, but instead to perform um, passive euthanasia, to just pull the plug and allow the person to die with malicious intent. Um, and in terms, um, yeah, okay, okay. Now, there's a huge debate on dignity. You guys have probably heard of this before. Death with dignity. Um, no one wants to be found in their bedroom with vomit covered all over them. Nobody wants their family to have to witness that. But many people, if they were to try to perform suicide themselves, they would end up like this, or maybe worse, you know, with a bullet in their head, or maybe their body washed up on shore. Nobody wants their family to go through that. Many people want to be able to die in a dignified fashion, one without death, one with their family around to be holding their hands for their last moments of life to be something that they can cherish, that their family can value and remember you in this, in this state, the last chance that they have to spend with you. Euthanasia allows many people to die in a dignified way. And this is one of the main arguments that people have when they want euthanasia, is to die with dignity. And um, most people who argue against euthanasia, I'll say, um, they don't actually touch this point. It doesn't seem as though they make any arguments against the death with dignity uh, argument for euthanasia. Um, I'm, I, I want to say I, I am trying to be as, um, of course, as unbiased. I have my own biases here, of course, uh, so recognize that when I speak. Um, but I, I'm, I'm trying to show both sides of the argument as best as I can. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so um, I, I, I personally feel as though euthanasia, uh, abortion, um, capital punishment, they're all forms of murder. Uh, I don't think that every form of murder is morally wrong. Uh, I don't think that there's anything wrong with a world that doesn't have life. Um, and kind of, if I were to escape my, my human biology and my own, um, my own preferences, I don't think that life maybe is really all that more valuable than a stone. So, uh, I <laughs> so yeah, right, yeah, thank you, True. So, um, I, I think that the question isn't, is life very, very valuable and we need to preserve life. No, I think that it really comes down to what we're going to look at here, the utilitarian question. Does society function better with euthanasia or does society function better when euthanasia is illegal? And the answer to this, unfortunately, is we just don't know. We don't know. This is a big experiment that we've been running for just a few years. We're going to find out soon if the people in Switzerland and Belgium uh, are really thankful for the opportunity to have their loved ones perform euthanasia, or we're going to see if it's something that most people regret. But the utilitarian question is one that we just can't answer yet. Um, there are a lot of reports of family members who are really thankful for doctors being able to perform assisted suicide on their patients. There are also a lot of reports of family members who are very angry and sue the doctors for performing physician-assisted suicide. It isn't clear, at least as far as I can tell right now, um, where the world is falling in this spectrum. Yeah, I see a hand over here. Um, just that everybody can hear you. Um, I was just going to ask, so I remember maybe like f maybe five to eight years ago, there was quite a highly publicized case of euthanasia or like dying with dignity. It was like a 26 or 28-year-old. Um, she had terminal brain cancer in the U.S., and she actually moved with her husband to Oregon to get um, residency so that she could, um, you know, do this dying with dignity. And uh, she actually gave 
a lot of interviews with this like sort of pro euthanasia group. I don't remember the name of it, um, and a bunch of their videos are on YouTube. But she basically argued, you know, this is my story, and she kind of gave that like final interview before she did like take the the medicine that that she filled. Um, I don't know if you you like had heard about that case, but it was pretty interesting. The the dying with dignity, like what you were talking about, dying with dignity, yeah. It's very common, this, uh, this scenario of someone in their, in their home country or their home state being unable. Um, we're going to see this in a minute. The next section that we have is on uh, specific laws around the world related to euthanasia. Um, and <laughs> I want to get the number right, but it's something like 20% of all of the euthanasia cases in Switzerland, they were actually performed on uh, Germans who had crossed into Switzerland so that they could receive uh, physician-assisted suicide. Yeah. Okay. Now, on the other side of the debate, um, maybe one of the most powerful arguments is about coercion. So we say that human beings, let me go back here, we say that human beings have the right to uh, request physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia if they want it. They have autonomy over their own body. Um, but like, uh, I don't know your name, but like this gentleman over here had mentioned, sometimes we're not making decisions very rationally. Maybe we're under um, uh, distress from a drug or some addiction. Um, and it seems like there are a lot of examples of this. So, for instance, if someone feels as though they can't pay their medical bills. Suicide, physician-assisted suicide, might seem like a very financially responsible position. Um, if someone doesn't want to put the financial responsibility on their whole family, and instead um, they, they, they want to be able to leave their family with as much wealth as possible and not drain all the bank accounts, maybe they'll choose suicide. Well, then they're, they're choosing to kill themselves because of finances, because of money. Is that the reason why we want people to end their life, right? Do we want to give people the opportunity to make that decision if they're being coerced by money? Um, also, there are some very high life insurance policies out there. So if the family is making the decision for physician-assisted suicide or for euthanasia, maybe it's actually because of the payout that they're going to receive, Maybe the health insurance company actually doesn't want to pay it. Or if we have a single-payer system um, in uh, some country with universal health care, maybe the state doesn't want to pay this money and would prefer the person to have euthanasia performed or physician-assisted suicide performed. So, for instance, we have Stephanie Packer. Um, Stephanie Packer was a, uh, still is a wife and a mother of four. She's from California in the USA. Um, and she was diagnosed with a terminal form of scleroderma, which is an autoimmune disorder that can damage your organs. Um, shortly after California passed a law permitting physician-assisted suicide, her insurance company denied her coverage of chemotherapy, but covered, her cov but covered the costs of physician-assisted suicide. I don't. Certainly within the last decade. Not defending it, but it could have been have to do with out of pocket uh, lifetime access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, if, if you have a phone, certainly, uh, certainly you can look it up. Yeah, Stephanie Packer, if you want more information on this particular case. Um, all right, guys. So uh, we're going to break back up into, uh, in up into small groups, um, again, somewhere between four and six people. Um, and we're, we're going to discuss these three main questions. And if you want to touch on any of the arg other arguments here, you're certainly invited. So question number one, would society, this is the utilitarian argument, would society as a whole improve or worsen from the legalization of physician-assisted suicide? Number two, is death by physician-assisted suicide less natural than death by refusing care? And maybe an addendum here would be, is naturalness 
the barometer with which we want to measure the morality of something. You know, uh, anti-LGBT activists have said that that's unnatural and that's why it's wrong, right? So, um, yeah, you can talk about that. Um, and then the last one: Is there any substantive difference between terminating life-sustaining care, that is pulling the plug, and assisting in suicide, that is actually giving the pill? Right. Uh, that's the fairness and, and equal opportunity debate. All right, guys. So we're going to break up into small groups. Before we do, uh, I just want to see, does anybody have any more haikus that they wrote or, or drawings that you'd like to share with us? And we'll collect them for the debate. True, it will come around. You can just raise it up in the air uh, while we break into small groups. Cool. So we're going to take about 15 minutes for these. Then we're going to come back. We'll have the, uh, the drawing for the haiku contest. We'll have one more talk on the laws of um, physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. Um, we're then going to look at... Uh, we're then going to look uh, really briefly, actually, uh, at end-of-life directives. Um, and then we're going to call it a night. So thank you very much, guys. Go for it.